Um, good afternoon. I'm Barbara Groves again, and I'm very, very happy and pleased to introduce Dr. Mark Fishman, who is an addiction psychiatrist and member of the faculty of the Department of Psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He is our medical director at Maryland Treatment Centers, Inc., which includes Mountain Manor Treatment Center of Baltimore, Emmitsburg, as well as uh, several other adolescent and young adult addictions and dual disorders program in Maryland. Dr. Fishman's academic work has focused on models of care and treatment outcomes in adolescent addictions, in particular opioid dependence. And just to add this, Dr. Fishman is like our clinical Captain Kirk. And he explores frontiers wow. where people, no man has that's dared awesome. to go before. That's, that's our Dr. Fishman, who's also a very nice person with a great Beating sense of Scott. humor. <laughs> nice person with a great sense of humor. And one of the few psychiatrists, by the way, that I was in my own adolescence, too. And that says a lot for those of us who have been in the field 20, 30 years and know each other. Um, the other important thing to say about Dr. Fishman is this. I have the wrong glasses on, I can't see a bloody thing. Uh, Mountain Manor Treatment Centers in Baltimore, Maryland, along with Mountain Manor's medical director, or Dr. Fishman, has been named one of five national recipients of this year's SAMHSA Science to Service Awards for Office-Based Opioid Treatment. This national awards program promotes excellence in the treatment of opioid addiction by honoring providers using pharmacotherapy and other innovative approaches to enhance patient outcomes. And here he is. Dr. Mark Fishman. Well, well, thank you, Barbara, for that kind introduction. The, the most important thing, thing I, I want to be known as, is father of three and big loser in the <laughs> eyes of my 15-year-old teenager, which is my <laughs> current title around the dinner table. But anyway, what I'm going to talk, to, uh, talk about today is uh, the role that adolescent development and in particular, what neuroscience and emerging brain science teaches us about adolescent development, what that role has in trying to understand teenagers a little bit better, and hopefully beyond that, understand what we can use that information for clinically, if anything. So maybe I'll, I'll persuade you that it's relevant, and maybe I won't, but that's at least the conversation. Say, so what, what can we learn from development? What can we learn from what biology teaches us about brain development? And, and can we apply that? Um, how many in the room, just to get a sense, uh, work with teenagers clinically? All right, so some of you. Uh, how many in the room want to work with teenagers but don't? Nobody. <laughs> how many in the room um, have parented teenagers? How many in the room have been teenagers? <laughs> yeah, all right. All right, so everybody's is at least a tourist and maybe closer. And one of the themes that uh, I'm going to keep coming back to is that uh, we're all, in some sense, tourists on planet teen, and trying to understand what that means in relationships, in relationship to building relationships with teenagers and having uh, clinical effectiveness uh, with teenagers, I, I think is really important to be explicit about and to pay attention to, because we really are just visitors there. Uh, so here's how I'm going to organize the conversation. And by the way, it's a small enough room that you guys can feel free to interrupt me and ask questions and throw tomatoes and whatever. I, we don't have to just do it lecture style. And I've been told to repeat the questions, which I'll try to remember to do. You can remind me. So first, I'm just going to talk briefly about this idea of developmental vulnerability. How, how come it is that teenagers are especially vulnerable in the area of addiction? Um, and that we don't need to know necessarily a lot about brains to know. We just know developmentally that it's a time of flux. And I'll show you some uh, epidemiological data to support that. But being a teenager puts you at risk. Duh. But we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, then I'll have a little bit of a primer on uh, biology of brain development. And it might be boring to some of you, and it might be new to some of you. But just to pull some of the basics together, uh, I will try, I'm a bit of a science nerd, so I'll try not to be too technical and not to get too into the biology, which kind of excites me, but may not be as exciting to you, but we'll talk a little bit just about that as background. Uh, then I'll talk about why that biology, uh, or what that biology tells us a little bit about teen troubles, and what about the brain uh, predicts some of those typical teen troubles that you're all familiar with. And then what I hope we'll spend the most interesting part of the conversation on is what to do about it. What are some of the interventions? What are the clinical implications? How, do you, how would we respond to teen development or the teen brain? 
And can we change the team brain? And that'll be a little bit more speculative because uh, I don't know the answer to that, but uh, maybe take you on a little bit of a science fiction trip about what we might hope for that uh, we might think of in the future in terms of interventions that might help us change teen brains for the future, for the, for the better. I'm also going to give you one example of how I know we can change teen brains for the worse, but we'll get to that. So here's the Gary Larson view of mysterious teenagers and the shrink saying, just plain nuts, right? So they're a bit mysterious to all of us. And even though we've all been there, uh, it's hard to remember, and it's never the same as we remember it and each teenager thinks that they're discovering everything anew and that as fuddy-duddy old people, we couldn't possibly understand. And that's the reality that we start with, right? So some things never change. Um, here's a quote uh, about teenagers and about culture. We live in a decadent age. Young people no longer respect their parents. They are rude and impatient. They frequent taverns and have no self-respect. So is this true over the ages? Where, where do you think this comes from? How old is this? Last week? 1837. Give me another vote. 1940. Give me another vote. 3000 BC from a cuneiform tablet. So some things never change, right? So teenagerdom as a developmental transitional period as having special qualities in opposition to where us adults look at it, it's an old idea. Uh, so the media has gotten a hold of this idea, right? The team brain, you can remember this cover maybe from when uh, Brad Pitt was new in that movie Troy, this is when it came out. And here's a New Yorker cover, again, the teen brain. And you can see in the teen brain, the important parts are MySpace, that dates it a little bit, right? I guess now it would be Facebook. But um, instant messaging and video iPod and all the things that are so critical in teen brains that may or may not be critical uh, in, in our old brains. But this has been a bit of a media thing the teen brain, what is special. And I think that some of that as a sound bite has value. I think some of it is overdone, and we can talk about the pros and cons. But it's definitely become a phrase uh, that's floating around. Uh, and let's talk about why that is a good thing or a bad thing. So developmental vulnerability, what is it about this period of uh, this age in the lifespan that is so vulnerable? One thing we know is that it's the age when addictive disorders typically have their onset. Right? So this graph, sorry for it's being busy, it looks at for alcohol, for marijuana, and for tobacco, and no, just those three things, when the peak incidence of addictive disorders are. And you can see these are pediatric illnesses. These are teenage illnesses. It's not that people don't have addiction throughout the lifespan, but when does it start? It starts in the teenage years, so that's when we have to be concerned. That's why we care about the teen brain. That's why we care about adolescent addiction, is because that's where the action is, right? It's where the ascending limb of the onset of these disorders is. It's where most people get started. And it's not just addiction, but it's also psychiatric illnesses, right? When do psychiatric illnesses start for most people? It's not that people can't get sick when they're adult, but a quarter, I mean a half of all psychiatric disorders have onset before age 15, and three quarters of psychiatric disorders have onset in the third decade of life before age 24. So there's some coincidence there in that vulnerability. Lots of emotional, behavioral risk stuff is happening. That's not a surprise to anybody in the room, but again, it's a highlight of vulnerability. Here's another way of looking at it. If you look retrospectively at adults, and try to categorize them by do they have a substance problem? And in this particular study, the definition of having a substance problem was having one or more of the dependence criteria from DSM, whatever they were up to at that point. DSM 12, 13, I don't know where we are. But wh wherever we were at, one of those criteria. And what's the likelihood as an adult of having a substance problem based on age of onset of use of that substance? So you can see onset below 15, onset between 15 and 17, onset, the, the onset greater than 17 for tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana, right? And look at the narrow window of developmental vulnerability between before 15 and after 17. We're just talking about three years. Doesn't seem like a lot, but it's a forever 
in the lifespan of a teenager, and you get from a two-fold to an eight-fold increase in the risk of having a problem as an adult just from having onset before age 15. So it's a very, very serious risk. And if you look across the top, so I can get this pointer to work. Yeah, if you look across the top at the onset below 15, you can see from all three of these substances, you have a 25% chance of coming to some significant harm as an adult if you try before you're 15. So don't do that at home, right? Now it's too late for us, but the issue of prevention is an important one, and again, the issue of developmental vulnerability. So what are some of the things we think that go into that vulnerability? Why is that so? And we're gonna talk about what biology and brain science can teach us uh, about some, maybe some, of the mechanistic uh, aspects of that. So maturation, whether we know about brains or not, whether we have biology or not, we have had descriptive psychology for many hundreds of years, long before we had CAT scans and brain sections and neuroscience, and we know that maturation is a process, we know that it's a slow thing on the one hand, it takes time and it's gradual, but it also comes in these irregular periods of on, off, and spurts, uh, and that when we say slow, remember we looked at three years, which sounds like a very short period of time, as having a great impact. So slow by one perspective, fast by another perspective. I sometimes talk about teen years, the same we talk about cat years and dog years, and teenagers tend to have a different kind of dilated expansion of what time is like, like next week is forever. That's actually true when you think of how much things are changing psychologically, and as I'll show you, uh, as they're changing biologically. We also know that although we can map typical patterns in the population, what happens at a certain young age, what happens in front of a mid-teenager, what happens at an older teenager, we know what those patterns are. We also know that there's individual variation. So we can talk about milestones in the average lifespan, but we also know that John is different from Jim, is different from Keisha, and different kinds of teenagers or different individual teenagers develop at a different pace. We know that there are gender differences with individual variation. For example, we know that girls mature biologically faster than boys or emotionally or socially in a different pace than boys. We also know that whereas most of development happens in a congruous lockstep across multiple domains, now what do I mean by that? Think about development it occurs in the physical domain, it occurs in the social domain, it occurs in the intellectual domain. You know, there's different flavors of development. And for most normal teenagers who are getting along on average, most of those things come along at pace. Now, as we talk about, for boys in particular, right, we might see that social development lags behind physical development. There, there may be some incongruencies, but for the most part it comes along. But when teenagers are in trouble because of pathology or environmental stressors or mental illness or addiction or educational deprivation or poverty or all the other kinds of things that happen to the kinds of teenagers we're talking about, we get more incongruity across domains. So the expectation of normal development that kind of comes along together starts to go away. And so it's important to think about development not just as one monolithic trajectory, but also as having multiple components across multiple domains. So for example, you may see addicted, comorbidly mentally ill teenagers who are very much developed in one aspect, but very immature in another aspect. An example we sometimes talk about is the pseudo-maturity of a streetwise kid who has survival skills, maybe even more than you or I have, but emotionally is quite immature compared to somebody of his own age. The same might be said in terms of physical maturation versus intellectual maturation and on and on. So that's another thing that we just need to know about um, what that trajectory looks like. So switch now to biology for a second, and here, here's the biology primer part of this. Um, when I uh, was in medical school, we learned one set of so-called facts, and now, how many decades later, 30, 40, 60 years later, whenever that was, uh, we've learned a lot more. So the cool thing about science is that it makes progress, and we've learned some really interesting new things. We've always known, well, we've known in the modern era of brain science, that we get 
interesting knowledge about functional development and function of the brain through understanding, one, the geography of the brain. Where are different functions in the brain? What part of the brain does what? So I'm gonna show you some pictures of that. We also know that the structures, both of the brain in a macroscopic way and in a microscopic way, and then in a cellular way, give us information about function. So we're learning more things about that all the time. What's new, is that when I was taught about functional and structural maturation of the brain, we thought that while a fetus was in utero, kind of baking in the oven, there was the first spurt of neural cell growth in the brain, and what we call proliferation, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but more and more cells developing, more and more connections developing, and that that process went on until age three-ish, then, from age three, there was a period of cutting back and pruning. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but in which cells would, instead of growing more of, would die away, grow less of, and we'd have more focus on architecture. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And that that was essentially it, that your total cell volume, connection volume, and brain volume peaked somewhere between age three and five, and it was all senescence after that. I'm exaggerating a little bit. but that that was where most of the growth happened. We've now learned, and this is kind of the interesting new part of, of this in the last 20 years, is that there's a second, maybe even a third wave of cell proliferation that goes on during the first decade and even on into the second decade, and another second and maybe third wave of pruning that goes on as long as into the middle of the third decade of life, so that the brain and its structure and its morphology and its dynamic pattern of connection is not really fully baked until you're 24, 25, 26, etc. So that's kind of new, although it shouldn't be so surprising because we know from a, just a descriptive psychology point of view that teenagers are still changing in their behavior, in their emotions, in their resilience in their risk on until their mid-20s. So it shouldn't be so surprising that brains, when we find out that brains are changing too. But that's very interesting to learn more about the underlying biology, and I'll show you some pictures. We also now know much more about how synaptic connectivity and brain structure and the circuitry and the pathways, although much of that is pre-programmed, lots of it is based on genetics, lots of it is based on the master plan, whatever, architecture design that God gave us, but there's also a very big component of that that is response to interaction with the environment. And experience shapes brain just as brain shapes experience, which is really cool, I think, and learning about that is relatively new. So let's look at some of those things. This is just a picture of a cross-section of some nerve cells. So, you know, the brain is full of nerve cells that talk to each other, and they have a body or a nucleus, and then they have all sorts of sprouts called axons and dendrites, which are the messenger arms in which they talk to each other in complicated networks that do all sorts of great brain things. And at birth, it has this density. It continues to proliferate from three months then to 15 months, and this is an example of the building of new cells, but even more importantly, new connections. So the cells proliferate, but more importantly, the axons and dendrites that give connection and the ability to build pathways and networks by communicating with each other. In addition, though, there's pruning. Now, why, anybody a gardener? Not one person, okay, so one of the things gardeners do is they prune a lot. Why do you prune? Why is that good? Why would you want to cut things back? Why would you want to take away from somebody's brain? If you're the master designer here, what, what's that all about? Because look, whereas it peaks here, somewhere in the first decade of life, it looks like proliferation has cut back to some extent from a cross-sectional point of view, so that there are fewer cell bodies and fewer connections. What would that be all about? Why would you get an advance? Because we, we know that development hasn't stopped. We know that intellectual and social and emotional uh, development is still ongoing. A 15-year-old has a more capacious brain that can do more stuff than a 7-year-old. So how can it do it with less cells and less connections? So think a little bit about the metaphor of a sculpture whose a sculptor 
who's looking to make a sculpture and builds up a bunch of raw material. And you want lots of raw material and you build up more and more clay till you get your clay big enough, but the sculpture alone in its potential capacity is not what you're looking for. What you're looking for is the real stuff, excuse me, the real stuff underneath. So whittling away the extraneous pieces to concentrate on what your ultimate functional pathways are gonna be. So everybody gets endowed with a whole bunch of potential nerve cells, a whole bunch of potential interactive connections, but they're not all necessarily gonna be useful. And in order to make certain of them functionally <coughs> useful, you stress those, whittle away the others, and make a more lasting architecture, right, to get at Michelangelo's David underneath the raw block of marble. What are we whittling out to get there? And as I say, some of that is pre-programmed, so some of that is in the master plan, some of that is in your genetics, some of what pathways you might end up happening are because who your mom and dad and ancestors were, and that you're a human, not a whale, not a chimp. But also, as we'll talk more about, it's what your life is like, what your experiences are like. And I'll just give you some illustrations of that that are, I think, uh, instructive from, uh, from experimental neuroscience. So it turns out that one of the systems we've learned the most about, because it's more mechanistic and easier to figure out in a lab and in an experimental way than complicated things like emotion and cognition, a system like vision, which believe me is complicated enough, but it's, you can imagine, it's more mechanistic, you can get your hands around it more than you can feelings and cognitions. So it turns out that although we are pre-programmed to develop certain pathways from the occipital lobe, which is the brain seat of vision, through the optic nerve, it's straight through, not elbow, but through the optic nerve, uh, into the receptors of the retina in the eye. It also turns out that the interaction of the retina and the eye with the environment has a huge and dramatic effect on how vision comes to fruition and on how the mechanism of vision evolves in the individual organism over the lifespan. So, if you are exposed to light at an appropriate developmental window, interactions between the mechanism that's pre-programmed and the environment produce the growth and the accentuation of certain pathways in the optic nerve, both proliferation and pruning, so that vision happens. But if you are not exposed to light, and you can't do this in people, but you can do it in experimental animals like kitty cats, it's not nice to think about, but if you blindfold kitty cats during a certain developmental time in, I think, when they're one week old or two weeks old, you end up never developing vision. And if you remove those blindfolds within that developmental window, say if, you, if the developmental window is two weeks and you give them light before three weeks, you might still recover vision. But if you wait till four weeks, the game is over. And so there are these narrow periods in which certain environmental interactions are critical to developing to fruition the architecture of the brain that leads to function, and then there are individual variations. So there are differences between species, there's difference between environmental interaction and lack of environmental interaction, and then there are differences between individuals. So I'll give you an example of that. Turns out we know a lot, and again, <coughs> muscle movement is much easier to get our hands around than emotion and cognition and addiction vulnerability. But we know a lot about where the mapping of the motor functions of the brain are. So we know that across the top of the brain in both directions are certain geographies that you can map very precisely about where is the left leg region and where is the right arm region and where is the lip region and where are the fingers of the right hand, etc. And all of us have a certain capacity manifested in the architecture and the pathways of the brain, but there's also individual variation. So for example, if you look at the part of the motor strip and a piano player compared to me, 
It will not just be that you know that that person has certain capacity for dexterous fine motor movement of their right and left hand, but you can look in the cortical, the cerebral cortical region that controls those motor functions and see more cells, more connections, and a greater morphological or structural region dedicated to the right hand. And you can see it in the brain. And that is not because your daddy was a piano player. It's because what you do becomes what you are, and you become better over time at what you do by reinforcing pathways, because learning and those pathways are manifest actually in brain structure. So hold that, because we're going to come back to that in terms of adaptive and maladaptive behavior. I use a neutral thing like piano playing and a simple, and a simple example of the motor region of the brain. But think about complex behaviors like drug seeking. So could those things be manifest in accentuated neural pathways that then lead to proliferation of connections? We don't know that answer necessarily. But as a metaphor, it certainly has possibilities, right? Another feature that we've learned a lot about in terms of the underlying biology of brain uh, development is a phenomenon called myelination. So we've talked about more cells, more connections. We've talked about pruning and shaping cells and connections and accentuating the ones that get used and the ones that are more important compared to the, compared to the ones that aren't. There's also a thing called a myelin sheath. Now these aren't brain cells, but these are additional helper cells that give this <coughs> wrapping to nerve cells. And this wrapping helps nerve cells conduct more efficiently and faster. So the places in the brain or the circuits in the brain or the pathways in the brain that are better myelinated are those that are more efficient, are more faster, and those pathways are accentuated. And this process of myelination is not complete again till probably at least age 20 and maybe not age 30. So again, another aspect of development and maturation that is ongoing that reflects why our psychological observations are possibly explained in what we're learning about how the brain develops biologically. Another very important phenomena is the order or the typical process with which brain development happens. Because it doesn't happen just in a uniform, willy-nilly way. I guess that, those are two different things. It doesn't happen in a willy-nilly way, and it doesn't happen in a uniform way. It actually happens in a particular, predictable geography, and that geography carries with it a particular functional order. It happens from back to front, and the structures that come online over time with that gradual maturation, maturation consisting of cell proliferation, cell pruning, myelination, and all those kinds of things that kind of happen as they go, but slowly <coughs> predict what features of the organism will be mature when. So the back of the brain, as I told you, is the occipital lobe, so vision is early. Emotion is kind of deep and in the middle at a place called amygdala. Motivation is deep in the middle of a place called the nucleus accumbens and a related area called the ventral tegmental area. And at the front, in a place called the prefrontal cortex, kind of at the front and under your eyes, is a place where much of higher decision making and strategic weighing of options and the brakes on the organism and judgment are located. And those are the last to come in. So we'll talk more about the implications of that, but you can see in that, or you can get from that, a predictable expectation that an organism that is not fully mature, particularly with clinical implications, whose prefrontal cortex is not mature till age 25, 27, 30, is not gonna have the function yet fully online that is encompassed by that structure. So we're not surprised then that judgment and other things that the prefrontal cortex does are not yet robust in a teenager. And it isn't just because they don't wanna, and it isn't just because they don't feel like it, and it isn't just because they don't care, it's also because they don't have the mechanism. So we'll talk a little bit about those implications. So what is predictive? 
And we'll go back and forth now between what psychological description and observation gets us and what we may or may not know about underlying brain mechanisms. What is problematic then in the maturation or the immaturity, more likely is what we're talking about, of adolescence that we can then relate to brain? So the emotional regulation of a teenager ain't right, right? One of the things that we know about teenagers is that they have funny feelings and funny emotions. So let's talk about that. On the one hand, they have strong emotions, but on the other hand, they have light, labile, changeable emotions, and they have a particular flavor to those emotions running the show, right? The, the bus driver in an in a adolescent is feelings, not cognitions, and that in part is predictable because the go, the gas, of the amygdala regions governing emotion are strong and coming online in a predictable kind of way. We sometimes talk about adolescent hormones. I think it has, turns out to have less about hormones than it has about brain structure, but it's the same kind of metaphor. We have a biological explanation of why feelings are so strong, but without the breaks of the inhibition of the, pre -cortical, of the, of the prefrontal cortical area. Another thing that we know about adolescents is that during that time in the lifespan, they have increased adventure seeking, increased thrill seeking, right? That's not a surprise to anybody who's ever met a teenager. And you can even tell yourself a story in an evolutionary way of why that might have been adaptive. Why did God make teenagers more adventuresome, more thrill seeking? Anybody got any, any ideas? Not, not that, I, not that I, he told me, not that I told me. And the thing, about, the thing about evolutionary biology is that it's somewhat speculative. We don't really know. But who can tell a story about that? So cannon fodder, we want to be able to defend the flag. All right. Give me something more fundamentally biological. Because this would have had to develop, this would have had to develop in rodents before there were, before there were flags. Okay, but why adolescents hunting? Who does the hunting? In, well, in, in primitive animals, sometimes it's the female, sometimes it's the males, but it's typically adults. But maybe you could tell yourself a story that that's when you have to learn it. So if you're gonna learn to do hunting, maybe to be pain insensitive or to be adventuresome, okay, that's a reasonable possibility, I like that. Get their own territory, and why, that's an interesting idea, and why do we care from an evolutionary point of view why it's important to have your own territory. So there's enough food to go around when you go out and sleep. And you can have more babies that survive. And the way evolution works, right, is anything that accentuates your ability to have more babies that live to reproduce, and if you keep trying to have babies in the same nest, at some point you might run out of food, you might have crossbreeding and inbreeding and other kinds of problems with fertility. And again, we're making this up. But the idea that you need to spread out to have successful, successful gene proliferation might be a reason why just before the age of reproduction, it would be good to build into the organism adventure seeking. Now, when you're an adventure seeker and you're a primitive, a mouse or something, what happens? Sometimes you get eaten by a, by a predator. So it's not a perfect strategy. Right? But evolution's a numbers game. And all you have to have is 51% survive, and it's a better strategy than not. So with all evolutionary things, and again, this is speculative, but with all evolutionary things, the idea is try to think of a reason why it's good for having more babies, and that's not so unreasonable. Part of the problem is we're no longer subject to these same kinds of evolutionary pressures, not that we're not uh, at, at all vulnerable to them, but we're, we have technology, we have agribusiness, we have other sources of food, but yet some of the difficulties with adventure seeking, the analogy of being eaten by a predator or other adolescent risk behaviors still is a major vulnerability. We'll also talk about immaturity and motivation. So although the uh, motivation centers, um, the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area come online before the uh, the uh, uh, prefrontal cortex, they're still relatively late, and their maturation uh, is late, and so adolescent motivation is different than adult motivation. Talk to you about different sensitivity to intoxication. So when we compare adults to adolescents, intoxicants, and most of this work has been done in alcohol, 
affect kids differently. And then we'll lastly talk about executive function, which is really about what happens in the prefrontal cortex, uh, and talk about what that is and how immaturity uh, affects adolescence. But all of that taken together, and we'll, we'll break them down one by one, but all of that taken together means that if we think about an approach to adolescent treatment, what kinds of interventions would help people who are still not fully formed, doesn't that mean that we ought to not really be thinking about an adult model of rehabilitation? We're not talking about creatures that have fallen off of a bicycle that they previously knew how to ride, and we just have to get them back on that bicycle. They've never been able to ride the bicycle. They're not fully formed. They're still growing. They're still in process. They're still not out of the oven. And so we have to think really about treatment as habilitative rather than rehabilitative because we're establishing functions like independent living and other kinds of things like that that have never fully been established in a person who's still not grown, who's still not independent, who still doesn't have a whole mechanistic ability to interact successfully with the environment. So I have to see if I can persuade you of that. Linda Spears uh, out at University of California um, and other people have done a lot of this work in rodents because it's not nice to do experimental exposure to alcohol on humans. Most IRBs wouldn't approve us of doing that. But compared to adults, we can show, and some of this work has been done in humans, but mostly in mice, we can show that if you expose adolescents to alcohol, they respond differently than grown-ups. And those of you who treat adolescents, or have had adolescents, or have been adolescents, can remember that alcohol is somewhat different. So some of the things we know is that the negative parts of drinking too much are not as prominent for kids. Right? One of the things that checks some of us anyway from drinking too much is the next day is a bummer. Right? But that's less prominent in adolescents. They have less dysphoric emotion, they have less somatic symptoms like hangover headache and other kinds of things than older people. So it might be that one of the vulnerabilities just there is they're less put off by the negative experiences of drinking, which in proportion gives you more to be excited about, about the positive experiences about drinking. They get less sedation. They get less motor impairment with acute intoxication. So they can, if you will, handle their liquor better. They get increased social facilitation with alcohol intoxication. What do I mean by that? Everybody thinks about alcohol a little bit as a social lubricant. They right? think it's a, they're cooler. They think they're cooler, that's right. And all of us might get a little bit of bravery in a bottle or from alcohol, but even more so kids. And it's more salient to kids, right? Because that's the time in the lifespan where those first social interactions and the importance of making emotional, romantic, and sexual relationships as a first pass, as a first venture into the life of that part of adulthood are so critical and so important. So put together the importance of it and that it does more for them, and there you can tell yourself a story of more of a risk for why they get more of a bang and have more of a vulnerability to alcohol and other intoxicants. And it turns out they get worse memory disruption, so they don't remember the bad things quite as well. Now, emotion is a funny kind of thing. Remember I was saying that adolescents have funny feelings, but they also have strong feelings. So what do you know about adolescent emotions? Well, one of the things that adolescents will say is that they are experts of feeling, right? They feel things like nobody has ever felt them before. Like they've discovered emotions for the first time in the history of mankind, right? Dad, I'm in love, all right? He is so special, well, maybe. But the notion of this discovery and salience and magnitude of emotion as being so prominent, right? And their sense of having such emotional insight, right? They can figure you out. They are in tune with the feelings of their friends. They're in tune with your feelings. Dad, you couldn't possibly understand what I'm feeling, right? You know, you've heard all these things. Is it true? Are they emotional experts? Actually, they're emotional morons, aren't they? <laughs> But it's the first time that anybody's felt like that. 
And there is a disproportion, an incongruity, between their sense of emotional insight and what we can actually demonstrate as their emotional accuracy. So how can I demonstrate things like emotional inaccuracy? Why do I say that? Why do I think that they're emotional morons? I mean, that's, that's not nice, that's an exaggeration, but why do I think that? As, as an adolescent? Yeah, why, why do I say that adolescents are emotional morons? You're, you're, you're experiencing this for the first time. Yes, so they don't have the experience and the wisdom and the feedback, but how else do we know? Well, scientists, psychologists can test it with experiments like things like uh, how do they read standard emotional cues in the environment? So give them an input, and do they read it right? What do you notice about adolescents? Do they read emotional context right? No. So here's one kind of test, right? You can, psychologists have developed all these kind of torture mechanisms to figure out all these kinds of things. They put you in front of a screen, and they flash faces at you, right? And so the notion here is, what does this face imply or transmit emotionally? What do you say? Fear. Looks like fear. Surprise. Fear. Right? Negative surprise. Fear. What do adolescents say? Uh, their mother's talking to them. <laughs> their mother's talking to them. Hate. Adolescents characteristically see the negative side of the emotional environment. They infer hostility time after time when there is none and impute negative feeling on cues. That's why adolescents are always over, that's part of the reason, anyway, adolescents are always overreacting. They always feel a threat. They always see hostility. You're always pushing their buttons. Not just because they have attitude, which they certainly do, but part of that attitude comes from this predilection to misread hostility and negative emotion in the environment. That's just the way the emotional world looks to their amygdalas. So it's predictable that adolescents are going to be defensive and overreactive and negative and want to fight. Because you started it, didn't you? And it may feel to you like you didn't start it, but they really do think you're starting something. So they have poor affective regulation, not good affective regulation the way they think they do. Yeah, question. Yeah. So it's a great question. What could a speculative evolutionarily, evolution, uh, evolutionary biology explanation be for why it's a good adaptive thing for adolescents to have hypertrophied emotions? Well, you might tell you, I don't know the answer, but you might say that it's a time of courtship and pair bonding. So a time when people are in the peak of their reproductive capacity, right? Because God kind of designed us to have babies when we're 13. I, I don't think that's particularly adaptive in this day and age, right? Well, what's that? Or maybe killed or be killed. If that's a vulnerable time, maybe, maybe you could tell yourself a story of um, being protected by immediate access to rageful, defensive emotions, maybe? The truth is, I don't know. Being inhibited. What's that? Rebel against being inhibited. Maybe, but why does that get you more reproduction? I don't know, but anyway, it's very interesting, yeah. Okay, sure. I mean, part of the developmental task of an adolescent is to move from what a young adolescent lives in, which is full dependence on parents, to a middle adolescent where peer associations start to take prominence over parental connections, to a late adolescent transition into young adulthood where we're moving towards autonomy, distancing from the home nest or the, or the parents, and moving on into autonomy. And so, yeah, maybe that's right. Maybe it makes sense to sever those relationships in some way so it's easier to move to Milwaukee and out of the nest. Well, I don't know. And isn't it going to that period of time they fight for independence anyway? Well, that's what we're saying. Maybe, maybe there's a function in that in fighting for independence. In any case, the point I'm trying to illustrate is I think it helps us understand what they do and why they do it 
based on their equipment, because I'm trying to persuade you that part of it is in the predilection of the natural equipment and its immaturity. Yeah? Well, that's another reason. So that there's lots of gas, but not a lot of bricks, okay? So what happens with teenage emotions is that their regulation is poor, but the emotions are strong. They have a limited repertoire. One of the things that we get through maturation and experience is the ability to have different emotional responses. They have only a couple of bu buttons to push. So it's not surprising that you get the same response over and over. They have this filter of perceived hostility. They have disproportionate affective processing. So their bus is being driven by feelings rather than by thinking. And that there's this disconnect between how they see their emotional insight versus what they have. So this shouldn't be a surprise. Again, this stance of hostility, this stance of overreactivity should not surprise us. And it should rather seem the exception when adolescents are calm and adult-like and equanimous and take it as it comes, because that isn't what's usual. <coughs> Another thing that happens is that we see changes in the way adolescents are motivated as they mature. So not only do we have enhanced adventurousness, but there's this underdeveloped capacity to delay gratification. Descriptive psychology, that's obvious. Kids want what they want when they want it, which is now, right? And it turns out that you can measure that. Psychologists, again, have these kind of fancy gizmos and mathematical formula, and they have a thing they call delayed discounting. I don't know if, if you guys have heard of this term, but it turns out you can compare what's the value of door number one, which is a smaller reward but sooner, versus door number two, which is maybe a bigger reward but later. Right? And things that are delayed, because they're later, not right now, we discount as having somewhat less value. And you can measure the magnitude of that discount. How much smaller or greater does a reward have to be in the future that you're willing to wait for it? If I give you a dollar now versus a million dollars in a hundred years, which do you want? <laughs> well, that's easy. I'm not going to be alive in a hundred years. I'll take the dollar fifty. Thank you very much. I'll take a nickel. Thank you very much. But compare that magnitude with what's the dollar now to the million dollars in one year, in five years, in one week. And you can measure that as an ability for an organism, an adolescent, a child, an adult, to what's the, what's the magnitude of the discount and the delay, and what they're willing to do in terms of the delay of gratification. Turns out that adolescents have a much bigger discount than adults. They want it now, even if it's way, way smaller. I know, big surprise. And drug addicts, in general, compared to age-matched controls, either if they're adolescents or adults, have much more of a discount on the delay. I want that blast right now, never mind the benefits of sobriety next week, or the punishment of contracting HIV next week. That's next week. I want what I want now, right? OK, so here's a little bit of a, a, a scan, just to do the, the science geek thing. Um, there is a part of the brain involved in motivational circuitry called the ventral, uh, ventral striatum, which is um, connected to the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area, that's very much involved in energizing the anticipation or the approach towards reward. And if you compare young adults to adolescents, so 15-year-olds to 19-year-olds, again, a very small window of change. We're just talking about four or five years difference. And you put them in the scanner, when they're making strategic decisions in a gambling task about what they're willing to do to get something in the future, and they're having that mental processing, str strategizing about how much they're willing to gamble, a dollar now for $10 in five minutes, that kind of stuff. Young adults have much more activation of the ventral striatum than adolescents. So this issue of delayed gratification is to some extent embedded in the biology of the capacity for that circuit to do its thing. Adolescents just can't do it as well. Now that's no surprise in our observations, but this might be part of the explanation. The last major uh, functional uh, area of uh, the brain I want to talk about is the prefrontal cortex and the concept of executive function. <coughs> 
and it's a concept that we talk about a lot, but I just want to make sure everybody's up to speed. Uh, executive function is that ability to make strategic decisions using all the inputs from elsewhere in the brain. You got your vision, you got your memory, you got your smell, you got your sense of reward, you got your motivation, but you still got to decide. Go, no go. Gas, brakes. Go for it, don't go for it. Take the marshmallow, the, can, the cookie out of the cookie jar, don't take the cookie out of the cookie jar. We sometimes used to talk about a, a homunculus, an old 19th century psychological term, that is, or, or in the Wizard of Oz, you know, who's the guy pulling the levers behind the curtain? And we talk about executive function as being the decision-making apparatus for complex, higher order, strategic decision-making, putting all the other cognitive processes together. And a lot of that integration is located in the prefrontal cortex. And that is slow to develop in adolescence and last to come online. So adolescents don't have the ability to inhibit responses. They have lots of go, they have lots of I want it now, but they don't have break as much. And so they look, compared to adults, they look disinhibited. You can create the same kind of difficulty in an adult if you put a railroad pike through his prefrontal lobes. And we sometimes use as a teaching example the 1894 historical case of Phineas Gage, who actually was working on the railroad and had an explosion, and the railroad pike did really go through his brain. And he was lucky, because when you know an inch to the left or an inch to the right, he would have been dead, but he survived. And what essentially happened is he turned into a cranky teenager, because he had disinhibition and the inability to put on the brakes. And he was described kind of as a garrulous, drunken, uh, cursing, tempestuous person. It was the first kind of descriptive neurology case example of what it's like as an adult to have frontal lobe damage. Well, kids, not because their frontal lobes are damaged, but because they're just not baked out of the oven yet, look like Phineas Gage and look like they're disinhibited with frontal lobe damage. So we sometimes say, if it's a car, it's got lots of acceleration, sleek, shiny, and sexy, handling okay, but no brakes. And that's a metaphor, although way oversimplified for what adolescents are like. Now here's an example of an executive function task. Name that color. Yellow. Yeah. Right? So I heard some yellow and I heard some red. Which is it? Red. It's red. But it says yellow. So what we have here, again, psychologists who love to torture us, is an example of a multiple signal interference and impulse inhibition task. What do I mean by all that gobbledygook? What I mean is, you have two competing signals of information, right? One piece of information is the color, and the other piece of information is the verbal signal for the color. Most of the time, we see them go together. In this case, they're competing, and they give us different information. Depending on what question, I could have asked you what does it say, I could have asked you what the color is, but either way, it's a competition. And this is not trivial. I mean, you guys in the room are all way smart, and it's still not trivial. You have to stop, you have to think about it. Your impulse is to go with one channel, but maybe you should go with the other channel. And you gotta slow down, consider the rules. What instructions did he give me? Which did he say the color? Did he say the word, right? And, and that requires you to put on the brakes and consider how to filter out competing inputs to come to an executive decision. And this is only two signals. It turns out that adolescents are worse at this than adults. Addicted people are worse at it than non-addicted people. Mentally ill people are worse at it than non-mentally ill people. And imagine adolescents with addiction and mental illness. And this is only in two signals. Now take life its own self, right? How many signals is that? And you kind of give yourself a vision of the multiplication problem of how life presenting competing signals requires impulse inhibition that adolescents don't necessarily have, necessarily don't have, especially when they're intoxicated, and how they're going to manage that. How are they going to resist temptation? How are they going to learn new skills? How are they going to change their behavior? This is called the Stroop test, by the way, based on, I guess, some Dr. Stroop who invented it. But life is a Stroop test, in crude metaphor, times a million. And adolescents can't do this well. Here's uh, Gary Larson again, the four uh, personality categories and a reflection of adolescent decision making. So it's 
The glass is half empty, the glass is half full, half full, no wait, half empty, no. What was the question? And, hey, I ordered a cheeseburger. <laughs> right? That's our guy. That's the adolescent, and that's who we have to contend with. So let's shift for a second from that good, bad, and ugly to what do we make of it. So if I've persuaded you with this kind of quick tour uh, through adolescent development and its neuroscience and brain biology uh, understructure, now the question is, what are you going to do about it? So what? I mean, it's good to know how it works, but how do you, how do you drive? How do you drive better? How do you get where you're going? How do, we, how do we help kids live longer so that hopefully they emerge out the other end <coughs> successful adults? So there's pros and cons to this. Um, I think there are implications for parents. I think there are implications for us as treatment providers. I think it's a little bit of an oversimplification and a marketing metaphor. And one of the things that I think is problematic is it's easy to pigeonhole kids and not appreciate their resilience and the strengths that they have in terms of their emergence into successful adulthood by saying all the things I've said, that they have no frontal lobes, that they're impetuous, that they're impulsive, that they're emotional morons. Right, we've got to be careful about that oversimplification. And we also have to be careful not to take away our wanting them to be accountable. Right? If we say, well, it's just my brain, I have no control, then we don't want that to be an excuse for not holding your brain in check. It's like the uh, alcoholics that say, well, doc, I mean, won't you go to court for me and testify that the reason I got that DWI is because I'm an alcoholic? And I say, well, now wait a minute. That, you don't want me to say that because what I'm going to say is that past behavior predicts future behavior. Judge not going to like that. Are you sure you want me to go to court? But the idea that my alcoholism, my disease, explains my drinking Right? We've all been in that clinical situation. We want to be a little careful of that. Or my underlying depression, or my trauma, or whatever it is. It's not my fault. It's not my responsibility. We, we want, on the one hand, to, re to uh, acknowledge and help people understand that there are issues of capacity that limit people, that it's not just pure choice and, and a moral problem. But on the other hand, we want to still keep responsibility and accountability in the picture. So that, that's, uh, I think, a downside and a con here. But the pro is, that we can, I think, out of this kind of information, distill at a level that, say, parents can apprehend and digest. We can distill out of that a user's manual for how to deal with a teenager. One of the things we want to say to parents is, it's a chaotic time. They're mysterious beasts. But it shouldn't be so surprising to you. It shouldn't be bewildering to you when they say they hate you, when they say it's your fault, when they say you may ruin my life. What, only once I ruined your life today? Uh, that's a good day if I've only ruined your life once. Yeah? Yeah, we spoil our children. Maybe we do. Uh, I, I, you know, I, science doesn't tell us uh, what uh, the truth is as social critics. You might say that um, we spoil our children more than we should. But I mean, I suppose what we do now is better than uh, enslaving them and putting them out in the fields as child prostitutes the way we did 10,000 years ago. So I mean, I don't know, yeah. But we, we also don't lose most of them before the age of five to infectious diseases. Maybe we shouldn't give them penicillin. It's spoiling them. I don't know. I'm, I'm teasing you all. But I mean, as far as giving them allowance, giving them allowance for nothing. Well, but one of the things I'm asking everybody to consider is the expectation that they could just be short adults is erroneous. And we have to think with a different filter about what they're capable of. And we have to get parents, and us as treatment providers, to set our expectations more appropriately to not set ourselves up for failure. And so for, here's an example. Don't take it so personally, right? Moms especially, dads too, but moms especially are wounded to the core, right? When their teenage daughters tell them how horrible they are. I'm a terrible mother, I must have done something right. Uh, re rethinking, did I give them too much allowance? Did I not give them enough allowance? I don't remember beating them, but maybe I was sleepwalking and I was beating I don't know what terrible thing I've done. Don't take it personally. This is just what they do. So can you, you can't detach totally because you still want to have emotional connection. But can you just let it wash it by, soldier on, and move on, and expect that there will be this liability? We want to get people to pick their battles, right? You, we know that anyway, but one of the things I'm saying
is that some of that comes from what brain science and developmental science teaches us. So I get this from parents all the time. I'm working with a 16-year-old patient who's an injection heroin user, right? They've almost died twice. This is their 20th episode of treatment. And the mom wants to yell at me at the kid about the latest piercing. Cut your hair! Get doctor! Will you tell him to cut his damn hair? Heroin hair. Right? So part of what we need to do, but you can't, as a parent, it's hard to detach because it's the thing that's in front of you and it's what has the emotional intensity. But part of what I think we need to learn is that the kid's emotional intensity is not necessarily our battle. We're supposed to be the grown-ups in the room, right? They're the, the emotionally moronic teenagers, not us. But it's easy for us to take the bait. So this is one way of teaching folks, don't take the bait because they are who they are, not because they're bad, necessarily, they may also be bad, but because it's what they're capable of. And we can predictably alter our responses to be more effective. One of the things you hear people say all the time to kids is, will you just grow up? Well, if only it were that easy, right? But their brains are not, as I've said over and over again, the brains are not fully baked. So we can't just ask them to just grow up. We've got to wait and keep them alive long enough. So here's a general example of, I think, how an attitude of developmentally informed interactions or developmentally informed treatment ought to go. First of all, we're just visitors and have some kind of respect for what that means, that they have their own kind of territory, that you want to give them that kind of space because it's part of what they're supposed to do is develop a different world from us. Right? And they're supposed to condemn everything adult. Somebody in the back said something about separating from, uh, from adults. So that, I think that's totally true. And they're supposed to create their own unique culture, no matter how alien and weird it is to us. We're not going to be seen as one of them. But we need to appreciate their culture a little bit. We need to know something about it. We don't have to like it. I joke sometimes, you don't have to, here, you don't have to like Kanye West, but you ought to know who he is. And you ought to be able to talk to kids about teach me what your experiences are like, and explain to me what the intensity of what you're feeling is, even if you're really only listening with one ear. I mean, I don't want to give that secret away, but you know, you, you don't have to pay that much attention. You just have to pretend, to, I'm teasing a little bit. But part of the issue is conveying that separateness and that it's okay. Here's some specific examples. Rather than telling them what to do, encourage them to formulate their own solutions. Will they get it right the first time? Never. But all you have to do is make sure they don't die. Right? So, yeah, if the six-year-old wants to cross the street without holding your hand, yeah, then you don't ask them to formulate their own solution. You hold my hand when we cross the street. But most things are not as clear-cut, black and white, and life and death as that. So give them enough rope to some extent. And part of what we want to do is get them to formulate their own solutions, even if they're half, predictably half-baked, because they need the practice of doing that. They don't know how to do it. They need to make mistakes, and then we guide them. But they will only get that uh, experience if they're given the opportunity to do those things, and if those are encouraged. Natural consequences are really great teaching tools. Us predicting that you're going to get lung cancer in 40 years is essentially worthless, right? First of all, they don't believe us. Secondly, we talked about delayed discounting. They don't care what happens in four years, in 40 years, right? I, I want a nicotine hit now. But if you arrange things such that they figure out what the natural consequences of their own mistakes are, that's a much more valuable thing. Again, as long as they don't die from it. We talked about a little bit about don't take the bait. So how to depersonalize, how to let it go, that it's not about you. Feels like it's about you, but it's not. It's about them. They hate you. It's not about you. It's about them. We're beginning to learn, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, about something called executive function training or cognitive rehabilitation training or cognitive remediation training. And some of this literature and some of this technology comes from the brain injury rehabilitation world, where neurologists and um, occupational therapists and other people who've been involved in trying to help people recover from brain injuries 
have begun to learn about interesting interventions to help people restore function after they've lost a piece of brain or a connection. Whether that's in terms of learning to walk again and strengthening, whether it's in terms of learning to speak again or regain language, whether it's memory training, whether it's thinking exercises. But you can imagine that those things might have value in adolescents who maybe never had those things fully formed or maybe had them knocked off a bit by their drug use and the toxicity of the poisons they put in them. And I'll give you an example of, of one such thing. Sleep deprivation. I harp on this a lot. Uh, we, maybe Walt, um, you're kind of a, like me, a, a curmudgeon of the modern age and that maybe we used to do things better in the old days. One thing I don't think we do a good job with is we keep them up too late with getting to school at 7.30 in the morning and staying up till midnight doing homework and then all the competing stimuli of internet and TV and instant messaging and whatever else they do after I'm long in bed. I don't even know what, what secret stuff they do. But they never get enough sleep. And do adolescents need more or less sleep than adults? More. more. That's right. Your need for sleep declines <laughs> steadily throughout the lifespan. And if you think teenagers are cranky and emotionally labile when they're rested, you know, wait till you meet a sleep deprived uh, cranky teenager. And so I think one thing that we can know as an intervention that emerges out of our knowledge of the biology is figure out how to get more sleep. Now I know that's not necessarily popular with the folks who are reading, writing, and arithmetic do more for school, and I think we have to do that too, but there must be a way to do it where we can get them more sleep. Another area of investigation is this thing called emotional regulation training in which we can explicitly try to teach kids how to do a better job about managing <coughs> the difficult labile emotions they have. And you've all seen those mood charts, a very simple example of that, for, you know, for six-year-olds. All the different faces, the 30 different faces you put on the, on the poster board of happy, sad, anxious, <coughs> irritable, questioning, right? So the first step, although that's a very kind of young kids, primitive version, but the first step is learning to recognize emotions. And you can explicitly train that. If that picture of fear I showed you is predictably misjudged by adolescents, we can teach them to be better predictors of what an emotional cue means in context. Even if they don't really believe it, you can at least teach them to think that they can at least teach them to guess what the average response is and that that's socially productive for them. So then, then, if they can start to recognize feelings on others, can they start recognizing feelings in themselves? So you may have heard of various different um, second generation or third generation psychotherapeutic techniques like mindfulness um, and um, uh, acceptance and commitment <coughs> training and that kind of thing. Some of those are based on the idea of affective regulation, that if you begin with the recognition of what the emotional environment is, first externally, but then internally, you become better able to modify it as appropriately adaptive. And I won't talk a lot about that, but it's an interesting avenue of investigation that hasn't been, I think, sufficiently explored in adolescent addiction, but has begun to be explored in adult addiction, and I think is likely to be very fruitful. Oh, I'm in the way. So it's really important to maintain credibility. We have a tendency, I believe, in predicting disaster to want to go always for the nuclear response. This is an old poster from um, Reefer Madness. I don't know if you guys re remember from, uh, from way back that uh, uh, movie about the evils of marijuana. Listen, marijuana is bad enough on its own without us having to say one puff and you'll kill your grandmother. The kids know what's true and what's not, right? And if we make up stories and embellish, we say things like, alcohol will kill your brain cells. Well, it ain't true. They will know the difference between what's phony and what's not. In fact, they live to point out how phony we are, right? So it's important to maintain credibility. What we have to, what we have to instruct them about is powerful enough without having to make it up. So I, I think it's important to uh, be straight, and then you get engagement points for that. I think another thing that we can learn uh, in terms of a developmentally informed approach is figure out ways 
that kids will want to come to whatever we're selling, that they will want to buy whatever we're selling. We could have the greatest interventions in the world in terms of laboratory efficacy, but if you can't get a kid to come, what good, what good is it? So what are the kinds of things that we can make treatment more fun with? More, maybe fun is too strong a word. Maybe, maybe we couldn't have fun treatment, although I imagine we could. But how, how do you want to make kid, how do you want to make treatment more kid friendly? Ask any teacher. Teachers are great at this, right? Good teachers know how to engage even an unruly classroom to try to engender an atmosphere of enthusiastic learning. Content is important, but the window dressing for teenagers is re and kids is really critical. So is it pizza you've got? Is it volleyball you've got? Is it rap music and hip hop you've got? I don't know, but what can you do to get them to come so that whatever you're trying to dish out at least gets delivered? And I think that we sometimes have too exaggerated a sense of, this is good for you. You ought to want to do this. Well, they, maybe they ought to, but they ain't doing it. So how do we sell it? And we've got to be better teenage-friendly salespeople. By the way, Madison Avenue and the advertisers have figured out how to do this. They, they can sell stuff to teenagers like nobody's business. Now, obviously, they have a few more zeros after their budgets than we do. But how can we learn some of their technology to learn about adolescent developmental stuff to sell effective treatment? And I think we've got to get better at that. So some of these things, you, these are ABCs. You know those things. But I think that each of the things on this list, again, about developmentally informed treatment, uh, come in part out of what I've been trying to persuade you of about adolescent developmental capacity as illustrated by brain capacity. So really quick, they need adults. They do rely on our support. After all, who's paying the bills? Whose house are they living at? On the other hand, they don't get that, right? And they think they're all grown up, even if they're not. And that dichotomy, that tension, is just part of what we have to struggle with. And just saying, my house, my rules, does not establish anything. <laughs> Right? That alone is not an effective, it may be true, but it doesn't establish the engagement. So you have to engage them at the level of they don't get that. They want to think of themselves as autonomous, even though they don't really do the real arithmetic. They learn a particular way. If you just lecture adolescents and expect them to passively receive information, it will go in one ear and out the other. It may not even make it in one ear. Again, teachers are good at this. We know, as we've talked about, that they have a predilection to be thrill-seeking. So why aren't we building our treatments to have skydiving components or something like that? That is, there is a normative function to adolescent adventure and thrill-seeking. And what are we doing to find pro-social, developmentally appropriate alternatives to the thrills of unprotected sex, injection, drug use, violence, blah, 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 the other things that we're trying to steer them away from. We're not going to find the alternatives that are attractive to them, for the most part, at the knitting club. Now, that, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, it's going to have to be something racy and hot and exciting. Rewards and praise are going to be more salient every time than criticism and consequences. That's just the way it works, because remember we talked about motivational maturation and the mechanism of how the nucleus accumbens focuses on immediate gratification and relationship i don't think i can I, I can emphasize that enough anybody who's worked with teenagers knows it clicks better if you have some kind of connection and you put money in the bank over time with relationship you earn the currency and you spend it only when you have it you can't spend the currency before you got it in the bank and if you tell them what you want them to do before they care who you are you're going to fail so all of those kinds of clinical implications and all of those kinds of interventions are things that we ought to do to respond to the teen brain. How should we take who they are, how their development is, how their brains are changing but immature, and how should we respond to that in a more adaptive, more effective way? Now let me ask another intervention question. Can we actually change the teen brain? Is there something we can do in our interventions 
that will accelerate maturation, that will improve maturation, that will make the healing go better. I'm not going to have great answers to this. I'm just going to be more question than it is answer. But what a neat idea, right? The idea is that if we're learning all this great neuroscience stuff about how the mechanism goes, could that then turn into something to really do mechanistically about that? So I don't think I have time to go into this in detail, uh, but I'll just give you a, a hint. Uh, one thing we can do bad is poison brains. We I was talking a little bit about things we can do good. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. And, and because, and I'll talk just a little bit about this. I was going to use this thing, this little um, uh, interlude about marijuana as an example of just that. Uh, and we could go on all day about other methamphetamine, about cocaine, about heroin, but marijuana is a nice example. And I am into it because it's kind of in the news these days, right? And everybody thinks uh, now that marijuana is not a drug. I mean, that's what the kids say. Marijuana is not a drug. What are you talking about? I mean, it's a medicine, right? So why, should, why shouldn't I? Right? So, but one of the things that we do clearly know, and I'll show you some science, or some biology, is that we can do it poorly. The forces of evil can poison teen brains, okay? So um, we know, and I don't have time to explain the experiment, but we, beyond a shadow of a doubt now, conclusively know that marijuana increases the risk for psychosis. That is not controversial anymore. We used to wonder, we had information that kids who smoke marijuana maybe had, on average, earlier onset of psychosis if they were going to develop it. But which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? And you can't do a randomized experiment where you give half the kids in the room uh, who have childhood or family histories of mental illness marijuana and the other half not give them marijuana in a randomized controlled trial. I mean, that's not, that's not ethical. So how could you ever do it? Well, the Germans in a, a group of uh, German uh, scientists in a long-term uh, medical cohort study, which they weren't even actually looking for marijuana, they were looking at cardiovascular risk and health or something like that, but they happened to also ask questions about marijuana and psychosis. And this has cleared it up, no doubt. We know that if you look at um, those kids that did not have cannabis use at before baseline and did not have psychosis, before baseline, and then look at them between time one and time two, those that had cannabis use had greater incidence of psychosis. So this is no longer chicken and egg. We know the cannabis use happened when it hadn't happened before, and we know the psychosis happened afterwards when it hadn't happened before. Now, I'm not saying that everybody who takes a puff will get crazy. Uh, again, remember, we're supposed to be credible, so I don't want to exaggerate the risk. What's the average incidence of psychosis in the population? Maybe it's one or two percent, right? So one or two in a hundred people get psychotic. Turns out this is still a small number. So three or four or five percent of marijuana smokers get psychotic. On the one hand, yeah, the good news is it's only three or four or five percent. The bad news is three or four or five percent of marijuana smokers will get psychosis. And we can tell it's because of marijuana use. And there's a two-fold increase in the rate of psychosis after marijuana use, and a two-fold increase in the persistence of previously occurring psychosis with ongoing marijuana use. And here's just a picture of what that might look like, right? So some people get a little psychosis and it goes away. Some people might use a little marijuana and their psychosis is worse or it comes on and then it diminishes over time, but maybe <coughs> multiple uses of psychosis over time change the trajectory of some underlying vulnerability. Is that a family history? Is that a genetic trait? Is that some other cause of psychosis that then gets accentuated by marijuana use? We don't know. We don't have that biology yet. But there's no doubt now that some group of vulnerable kids will have this horrible and catastrophic outcome from the use of marijuana. So you can make a brain worse by poison. <coughs> and we even have I won't tell you about this, but we even have some genetic understanding of the mechanism. We know that some people who have certain genetic makeups are more likely to have marijuana-induced psychosis than others. So we're getting down to the mechanism. I wish, I wish I could tell you more about the mechanism of the good things we can do. We always learn about the bad things we can do before we learn about the good things. Let's talk about some of the good things we can do, because that's more interesting. Skills rehearsal 
as a general concept, I believe, is one of the <coughs> most important things we can do to improve the trajectory of adolescent development, and I believe, change the adolescent brain. Now, why do I say that? Remember what I talked to you about before, about the interaction between brains and experience, between architecture of brain, pathway development of brain, and environmental interaction. <coughs> Remember what I said about the brain changing if you're a piano player. You have a bigger motor strip affecting fine motor movement if you practice the fine motor movement of the hands. So there's a little bit of the brain called the hippocampus, which is involved in memory. And it turns out that cab drivers develop bigger hippocampuses because they got to remember a lot. And it turns out that there are some places where navigating the streets requires more memory than others. I don't know London well, but I hear that London does not have a predictable grid map. First Street, Second Street, Third Street, Avenue A, Avenue B, Avenue C. What I understand is that London is a mess, that there's no rhyme or reason, and either you memorize it or you don't. Well, it turns out that the cab drivers in London have bigger hippocampuses than cab drivers in other cities and the non-cab drivers. Again, because the interaction with the environment and the development and the strengthening and the accentuation of that particular memory function also reciprocally changes brain. So now fact ends and speculation begins. So put an asterisk next to what I'm about to say. To the extent that you get better at what you do. Oh no, here's one more piece of science. At the cellular level, there is a biological phenomena in neuroscience called long-term potentiation. And we can study this in cell culture, we can study it in mammalian brains, not so good at doing it in humans because it's not very nice, but the idea is at the individual cell level, if you make a neural pathway go more, biological features of the cellular connection, the synaptic connection, the communication between cell A and cell B, at the cellular and neurochemical level are demonstrably increased. This illustrates it by showing that if you keep firing this neuron, and these are neurotransmitters coming out of presynaptic vesicles, coming into the postsynaptic receptor, and then changing the flow of calcium. Uh, again, won't bore you with all the biology, but a week later, after you make this go, there's more neurotransmitter, there's more synthesis in the presynaptic vesicles, there's more receptor, more intrasynaptic activity, and higher activity, as measured here, of calcium transmission. So that's at any age? I'm sorry, what? Any age? The older you are, uh -huh. the less plastic you are. Plastic meaning changeable, mm -hmm. okay? So that's why those of us that are ancient like me can't learn languages anymore as people who are under the age of 13, <coughs> right? That's why cats who've had their eyes closed after week four, no longer can develop light sensitive vision. So some things go in windows. But yes, this is a lifelong phenomenon, though, to a lesser extent. So this is at a primitive single cell level. But now tell yourself a story combined in metaphor. So we're speculating here. I don't have real science. But think about do complex behaviors, behavior patterns, <coughs> learned strategies, <coughs> emotional patterns, the more you do them, are they more entrained in structure and in physiology and in mechanism? It's likely that that's true. We get better at what we do, not just at the macro level, but in an underlying bi biological way that allows that macro level to happen. Again, another metaphor would be the more you exercise a particular muscle group, the better that, stronger that muscle group gets. You don't start out by bench pressing 120. You get there gradually by increasing the biological capacity. I suspect, that's not important what I suspect, neuroscientists who really know this stuff, as opposed to me who am just a tourist, neuroscientists suspect that complex emotional behavioral patterns are going to look the same one day when we figure it out. So the more you get, the more you do math homework, the more your math brain thingamajiggy is going to be a vibrant functional pathway. But probably the more you do drug seeking, or the more you do violence, or the more you do indiscriminate sex, 
blah, 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 you get it, the more those pathways are going to be more vibrant. I believe, so that's, that's a way of summarizing that the more we can do specific skill training, I believe it will turn out, speculative again, I believe it will turn out that we are improving adolescent brains the same way that non-impaired adolescents are having their brains change through everyday maturation and skill acquisition. That's probably <coughs> just the way it goes. That's probably how you learn to be a hunter, how you learn to be a mathematician, how you learn to dance the two-step. But if we're talking about skills that are relapse prevention skills, or emotional regulation skills, or cognitive skills, those probably, I think, will turn out are entrained in brain changes. We can show I'm going to skip right to the end of this here. We are just beginning to get information about what the treatment of comorbid depression perhaps can do. We know what it can do clinically. It turns out that's been studied quite a bit. The best study so far was a study done by Paula Riggs at the University of California in which she randomized kids with substance, adolescents with substance abuse um, into those treated with CBT plus placebo versus those treated with relapse prevention CBT plus Prozac. And it turns out that depression improves preferentially in the Prozac group. But she was wondering, does drug abuse improve prefer preferentially in the, in the Prozac group? And it turns out it doesn't. But it does turn out that CBT helps depression. That shouldn't be a surprise to lots of you in the room who are psychotherapists. CBT is a powerful tool for the treatment of depression. And it does turn out that whether you got Prozac and your depression got better, or whether you got CBT only and your depression got better, if your depression got better, you were more likely to have your drug use reduce. So when you have comorbid conditions, the treatment, in this case, adolescent depression with comorbid uh, drug addiction, if the depression gets better, the drug abuse gets better. That's a nice clinical result. But what Paula Riggs did, which was, and, and that's, that's very convincing. This is less convincing, more speculative, because it's only a subset. But she was also able to show a nice brain imaging result in which pre-treatment, when you show activation cues that are either drug-related or non-drug-related motivational cues, like a milkshake or a video game that kids might be interested in but are not drug cues, you can see one area of the brain lights up in the pretreatment kid, and this is the deeper motivational structure, and there's more prefrontal light up in the post-treatment undepressed kid. Speculation, but is that possibly because when undepressed and with better relapse prevention skills, there's more activity in the prefrontal cortex with inhibition accentuated, with breaks accentuated, with more capacity for stopping and processing the temptation than previously when it was all about reward and anticipation and go. Early times, we'll have to see if this gets replicated, we'll have to see if this parses out. But how exciting that we can show brain changes, possibly, based on treatment. So I think that's very exciting. I want to end with one last thing. Remember I said that people are working on um, cognitive rehabilitation strategies taken in part from a brain injury treatment. So there's a cognitive function called working memory, and it's an essential building block for lots of cognitive processes. It's that thing you do when you not just remember something, but you hold that information in your head and then process it to do something with. So it's memory that you work with. The working memory, what can you hold in your attention while you <coughs> manipulate it? So for example, can you keep a, a seven-digit phone number in your brain long enough to enter it into your BlackBerry and associate it with a particular contact and use that information? And as you can imagine, that, although it sounds very fundamental, is not necessarily so easy to do especially as five numbers get to six numbers, get to seven numbers, get to 12 numbers, and you have to do more and more abstract manipulation with it. And it's the building block with which you can do lots of other things, executive function, decision making, et cetera. So working memory is impaired in substance abusers. It's impaired in adolescents. It's more impaired in adolescent substance users. 
We looked at uh, some pilot data with 20 of our kids admitted to residential treatment, and the working memory index on average was at the 14th percentile of the average teenage population. That means 86% of the average population has better working memory than the average kid admitted to Mountain Man. Now, which comes first, chicken or egg, right? Is that because people with bad working memory are more likely to be addicts? Or is it because people who are addicts have poisoned brain and pickle their working memory? And the answer is yes, <laughs> right? It's, I'm sure, in both directions, although I can't really show you the science that demonstrates that. And when we did that Stroop test, remember I showed you the two signal color interference, the average kid at Mountain Manor was at the 37th percentile, right? So what's the arithmetic there? 63% uh, of average teenagers do better than the average kid admitted for addiction treatment. So there's a clear impairment. Now in other studies, people have shown that if you have poor working memory and or other cognitive deficits, you're not likely to do as well at, at treatment. Now those are adult studies. I, I wrote adolescent here, that's a speculation, but I'm pretty sure it's true. I mean, you're not gonna learn relapse prevention skills as well if you can't think as much, if you can't understand what's happening in your group. One of the things we ask kids to do all the time is learn a particular conflict resolution skill and we try to teach it and if we're really good, we try to get them to rehearse it. But what do you think happens in the thick of the moment when they're hot and their emotions are flaring? You think they remember the lesson they learned last week in group and they pull it out of their backpack and you know, insert it in the go-kart? It's very hard for them to do and that takes sophisticated brain and cognitive functions. So it's not surprising that cognitively impaired or executive function impaired or working memory impaired adolescents would do worse at treatment. So one question is, if we can improve working memory, could we get better treatment response? Well, in adults, people have shown that working memory training improves treatment outcomes. And when I say working memory training, I'm not talking about an intervention that has anything to do with drugs. I'm just talking about computer-based training that teaches you to remember better. More digit spans, better manipulation of things that you keep in memory, the ability to remember strings of words and compare them to each other and find opposites and that kind of stuff. So one question is, could we, and, and people have also shown that that improves outcome in adolescent ADHD. So one question, which uh, we're going to pilot um, with my colleague uh, Miriam Mincer from uh, Hopkins next year, is can you take a simple computer program that improves or is supposed to try to improve working memory practice in adolescents and show whether or not that gives you a better outcome in response to addiction treatment or dual diagnosis treatment? Now, I don't know if it's going to work or not, so stay tuned. Uh, I don't know, but we have shown that you can use these kinds of computer programs at least to increase working memory in adult methadone patients. We don't have the data yet about whether that improvement in working memory improves their drug abuse outcomes. I mean, that's the big link, right? It's one thing if you can get their working memory to be better. It's another, does working memory make your drug abuse treatment response and your abstinence better? And that remains a, a, a big question. So if we really had the tools we wanted, right? It would be new brains, right? That would be the hypothetical miracle cure. We don't have that, obviously. We're not doing brain transplants yet. But I wanna make a last plug for just a conservative approach of tincture of time, which is a thing we say sometimes when we're talking about just let them do their natural biological growing up thing. If you can keep them alive long enough, Hopefully, a substantial number of kids, no matter how impaired, are going to have the proper maturational thing happen in their brain. They're going to myelinate. They're going to have the right pruning. They're going to have maturity, which over time, to at least some extent, is going to happen. So I think that giving people enough time, giving kids enough time, and never giving up on them is the simplest and maybe one of the most effective things that we can do and to remember that therapeutic optimism itself is a huge tool.
just encouraging kids and their caregivers and the people like us and you and other people who do these interventions that believing in kids and caring about them and keeping at it will make their brains better, even if it isn't because we know how to do something good with their brains, because God does. And if we give them enough time, my speculation is that there's more resilience, I think, in most of these kids than we give them credit. I, I hope that brain science will give us better stuff for the kids for whom this conservative approach doesn't work. But while we're working all that out, I, I just want to make a plug for, for therapeutic optimism in that way. And I'll quit there. I know I've gone over time. Two, two uh, websites that are worth looking at. Uh, Partnership for Drug-Free America has a nice animated thing with Ken, my colleague Ken Winters from Minnesota doing a teen brain lecture. That's fun to look at. And the NIDA site, uh, Teen Drug Abuse, has some nice biology lessons, some of which are actually uh, pitched at the level of uh, parents and teens, so, so they're kid friendly. And there's my email address if you want to yell at me. And I'll stop. And thanks. Well,